Let's get ready to do some math. Time for another AP Calculus instructional video. This is the video that's going out, I believe, on Tuesday, um, April 21st. I'm making it on Monday, April 20th. Um, a little bit of housekeeping. Okay, some of you guys received a message from me on Remind asking, um, you know, if you responded to a College Board email. There was a College Board email, a supposedly a survey they sent out to everybody to just kind of get a feeler out there how many people are going to be taking the AP exam. Um, a lot of you guys responded, okay? Many of you didn't respond. You didn't even know that there was an email. It's no big deal. You're still registered for the exam. Don't worry about it. But I did send you a remind. Try to get back to me. Let me know if you're taking it or not. You should all be taking it, okay? Don't be like, oh, I'm not going to take it. Forget it. If you got stuff going on, don't get me wrong. You know, if you got life uh, going on, things are happening with your family, totally understand that, okay? But um, if you can, you should take this thing, okay? I think you have a better chance of doing well on it than you might think, especially because they're doing a shortened version this year. I don't think they're going to go crazy with anything. Who knows? We'll see what actually happens. Um, but just let me know, and then, uh, you know, I'll input that information myself. You're still registered for the AP. As far as what you have to do to take the AP, I believe you're going to have to upload your answers in PDF format. You might have to get an app, okay, where you can take a picture. It transforms it to a PDF. Turbo Scan is great. Um Take a look at that information. I'm going to put some links up on the website. They're going to come out with more info April 27th. So try not to worry about that so much right now. But I don't want you guys to end up screwing up the AP exam because you didn't have enough time to upload your answer or anything like that. So we'll talk more about that as we get closer to the AP. A little do now action. All right, so pause the video. Try this problem. And now we're back. Okay, uh, this problem right here, you might be like, what the heck is this? G of X is equal to the integral from zero to X cubed of sine T with respect to T. That looks like a function that involves an integral sign with a constant lower bound, a variable upper bound. This is an accumulation function. Accumulation function, which is what we're going to be talking about today. And a lot of times they want you to take the derivative of an accumulation function. That means it's the fundamental theorem of integral calculus uh, part two. And to take the derivative of an accumulation function, remember, take that variable upper bound. The variable upper bound is the argument of the accumulation function. Plug him in for the independent variable. Integral sine goes away, dt goes away. So we get g prime of x is equal to, uh, not the sine of t anymore, but the sine of x squared. And you could bet your butter and I'll raise you a side of margarine, that this right here is going to be in, um, you know, a, a multiple choice. This would be a multiple choice type of question. This is not the correct answer. Remember, if you take the derivative of a function whose argument is not one single x, you got to use the chain, 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 chain rule, who makes me drew, who, um, you got to use the chain rule, multiply by the derivative of the argument, which is 3x squared. So I get 3x squared sine of x cubed. Not really popular for part two problems. Usually it's just an X up here. Otherwise it's indicative of a domain shift and stuff gets really crazy. Um, but could be a part one problem. I know you're not having a part one, but who knows? One of your um, free response questions, just got a feeling there's going to be one that has a lot of short answers in it. Like it's a lot of part ones um, without multiple choice, obviously. So it's just a feeling that I have. So we still want to practice stuff like this. You know, if you take a look, we're up to three point whatever, I think it's 3.4 accumulation function. It's very similar to the graph of F prime that we did yesterday. I hope you tried those problems, okay? I hope you tried the homework. Hopefully it wasn't too horrible. Um, sometimes I'll talk about the homework, sometimes I won't. The 2009 problem got a little frumpy, uh, you know, and you want to use the fundamental theorem on letter B. You want to find f of 4, and you set up f of 4 is f of 0 plus the integral from 0 to 4 of f prime of x. When you integrated f prime from 0 to 4, you couldn't use the graph. You actually had to integrate this guy right here. Just so you know, you could have used the u substitution, but things get wonky. Negative x over 3 is really negative 1 third x. And when you integrate mentally, you divide by the derivative of the inside. If you divide by negative 1 third, that's the same thing as multiplying by negative 3. Do the best you can, you know. Um, I will be sending out more assignments. You'll have another one that I think is going to be assigned today and uh, will be due on Friday. Don't quote me, but I think that's what I'm going for. Um, and I also look at views on my YouTube videos. They've been beginning to dwindle, especially since we started talking about AP review, which is an issue. Some people might be like, well, I'm just going to put it off and I'll cram over the weekend. You want to try to get in your AP calculus work every day. Don't just cram because then things aren't going to become part of your long-term memory. They're just going to be stuck in your short-term memory and they're going to be easy to forget. You want to try to do some AP work every day. I know it's not easy. I know you have a hundred things going on with other classes and God knows what's going on in your personal lives right now. But if you can, try to do a little bit of calculus 
every single day. You want to get yourself into a groove. So by the time you get to the AP exam, you're just solving problems on instinct, okay? It's things that you've actually seen before. So please, put in the work. Don't slack off, okay? We've been through so much this year, okay? Um, you know, put in your work for just a little while longer, and then you can rock and roll on that AP exam. You're going to feel proud and good. You know, let's take a look at 2005B. These are popular no calculator questions, so you could very, very likely see one of these on your AP. These are the graph of the derivative problems, which are pretty much the same thing. You'll see what I'm talking about in a minute. The graph of the function F above consists of three line segments. In part A, which is a part A, they say let g be the function given by g of x equals the integral from negative 4 to x of f of t dt and this right here is an accumulation function it's got an integral uh constant lower bound variable upper bound the second i see something like that i like to do this you might remember that we take the derivative right away okay because come on they're always going to have you take the derivative accumulation function to get g prime of x let g prime of x equal, take that x, replace it for the independent variable, integral sign goes away, dt goes away, g prime of x is just f of x. And then for kicks of giggles, you could even say g double prime of x equals f prime of x. You know, this will help you to solve certain problems, but it also help you with justifying, which people do struggle on. Um, you have to justify in terms of the graph that you're given. So you might accidentally justify in terms of G when you're supposed to justify in terms of F. This creates a relationship between G and F. It won't always get you full points, but it might help you out. And it can certainly help you out for just solving problems, right? You want G of negative 1, G prime of negative 1, and G double prime of negative 1. So if you want G of negative 1... That actually doesn't involve any of the work we put here. That's just, you know, g of negative 1 is the integral from negative 4 to negative 1 of f of t with respect to t. So we got to calculate some areas here, okay? And remember, we're integrating from negative 4 to negative 1. We're integrating forward the regions below. So we know that integral is going to be negative. Maybe put a negative sign down there just to remind you. Now you want the area between the curve and the x-axis. This is this shape, which is actually a trapezoid, but most people will turn it into a rectangle and a triangle. So this rectangle has a base of 1, 2, 3, and the height is 1, 2, so 3 times 2 is 6. Then this right triangle has a base of 3, a height of 1. 1 half times uh, 3 times 1 is going to be 1.5. Okay, so it's really just 6 plus 1.5, which is 7.5. Oh, yeah, negative 7.5. Good thing I put that negative right there, okay, to remind myself of that. You know, g prime and negative 1 is the joke of the year because g prime and negative 1 is the same thing as f of negative 1. You're telling me I want f of negative 1 and I'm staring at the graph of f? It's equal to negative 2. thought you had a challenge for me. Oh, g double prime and negative 1. Maybe that's a challenge. Well, g double prime and negative 1, that's the same thing as f prime and negative 1. Oh, f prime and negative 1. They didn't give us f prime. They gave us f. f prime represents the slope of f, the instantaneous rate of change of f, the slope of the line tangent to f at x equals negative 1. Wonder what the slope of the line tangent to f is at x equals negative 1. Wait, there is no slope of the line tangent because that's a sharp point, which means the function is not differentiable does not exist okay they said or state that it does not exist up here they didn't say to justify normally you don't have to justify with these little short answer ones unless they tell you to justify but really this one is because um the slope coming in from the left of negative one of f doesn't match up with the slope coming in from the right of negative one of f so the limit as x approaches negative one from the left hand side of the slope of f f prime of x is not equal to the limit as x approaches negative 1 from the right-hand side of f prime of x. I wouldn't worry so much about that, okay? I just worry more about these answers right here. Um, but really, part A, which I didn't even label. Wow, I'm being lazy. Should have been a part A, okay? You could pick up all those points right there. Let's move on to part B. For the function g defined in part A, this uh, function g right here, find the x-coordinate of each point of inflection of the graph of g on the open interval negative 4 to 3. Explain your reasoning. Point of inflection, well, surely that must be some sort of test, okay? And if it's a point of inflection of G, I want the G double prime line. But the G double prime line is the same as the F prime line. And I'm looking at the graph of F. You tell me I want to draw the line for the derivative of the graph that I'm given. And that's when I check slope increasing and decreasing from negative 4 up to 3. This thing starts its life by increasing. Folks, it increases all the way from negative 4 up to positive 1. 
I know some people get annoyed. They're like, wait a second, in between negative four and one right here, there's a place where the slope doesn't exist. It doesn't matter because the slope goes from positive to positive. Remember, for a point of inflection, you don't care about where a derivative, a second derivative is non-existent or equal to zero. You only care about that sign change in the second derivative. So it actually doesn't matter. Then you can see this thing decreases from one to uh, three. So pretty easy, okay? We can see we have an inflection point at x equals one. So inflection point at x equals one because then you need the justification. Some people say, because g double prime changes sign, you gotta justify in terms of f. They're like, okay, so f prime changes sign. But justifying in terms of f prime is not the same thing as justifying in terms of f. So what does it mean when f prime changes sign about f? Well, f prime is the slope of f. So you could say the slope of f changes sign. Um, I like to say the slope of f changes sign from positive to negative, which means f changes from increasing to decreasing because f changes from increasing to decreasing. But you could say because the slope of f changes sign, and you'd also be all right. You know, I know the justifications aren't easy, but you notice, you know, they're very similar from one problem to another. So keep practicing. And believe it or not, even if you don't completely understand them, you can still get a decent gist of what's going on, um, you know, just by following a process. Part C. Let h be the function given by h of x equals, whoa, another function. This is getting out of hand. Now there are two of them. Sorry, it's a prequel meme. Anyway, um, this is not an accumulation function. People are like, yes, it is. Well, it's not because it's accumulation function would start at a constant lower bound, end at a variable upper bound. So really, this is not an accumulation function. You could make it into one by swapping the bounds, which we're allowed to do as long as we do what? Very good, put a negative in front. And we also want to know, uh, find all values in the closed interval right here where h of x is equal to zero. So you actually don't need anything about the fundamental theorem. We don't need to take a derivative for this problem right here. So here's h of x. They want to know when it's equal to zero, all values of x for which it's equal to zero. Not the easiest thing in the world. You kind of got to think about this a little bit. But if x is equal to three, you know this is equal to zero because that's the integral from three up to three of f of t with respect to t. Let's start at three and end at three. Let's integrate. What's the area? It's zero. But there are other answers here, okay? And they're not so easy to see. But if you're going to end at three, if you actually back it up to one right here, positive one, you'll now notice if you integrate from one to three, integral from one to two is positive, whatever this area is, and the integral from two to three is negative, whatever this area is, but these areas are the same, so they will cancel out. You'll actually get an answer of zero for the integral right there, so it also works when x is equal to one. That one's not so easy, and it gets really filthy. If you back it up to negative one, you'll see it negative one, if you do the integral from negative one to zero, it's gonna be negative whatever this area is, okay? Then you do the integral from zero to one, positive whatever this area is. Integral from one to two, positive whatever this area is. Integral from two to three, negative whatever this area is. Do you see this positive and this negative will cancel out? This positive and this negative will cancel out? So negative one, also an answer. Hard to see, okay? Some people might've been like, well, I just knew the three. Well, that might yield you a point, just so you know, okay? So that's actually pretty cool right there. But it's not so easy to get these. It's not so bad to get one. Getting negative one starts to become a little bit extra. There are going to be problems in the EP problems that you've seen before that are easy to do, or at least you remember uh, seeing them before. Then there are going to be these other problems that spring out of the woodwork that you might never see again, okay? And this is one of those types of situations, even though every now and then something like this does show up. But really, try not to worry so much about that. Um, this is why we practice, so you can handle A and B like, it, like it's easy, you know, like hua, and then you got a little bit of extra time to think about C and D as well. Well, you know, D for the function H defined in part C, um, find all intervals in which H is decreasing, explain your reasoning. Well, H decreasing, surely, that must be some sort of test, which means you need to take the derivative of H of X, right? The first derivative test. Just remember, it's not an accumulation function yet until you swap the two bounds and make it the integral from three to X of F of T with respect to T, but you're only allowed to swap those bounds if you put a negative in front. Now I can take the derivative. I couldn't do that before. H prime of X equal two, pull the negative one to the side, it's just a constant. Take the derivative of this uh, accumulation function right here, we just get F of X. So believe it or not, H prime of X actually equals negative F of X, which is cool, because when you wanna know when H is decreasing, that's where I draw the line, the H prime line which is really the negative F line. How cool is that? Tis it bounded? Yes, it is from negative four to three. But people are like, how am I supposed to draw the line for negative F given the graph of F? Oh, you're telling me I want to draw the line for the opposite 
of the graph that I'm looking at, you're still going to check above and below, but you're going to reverse them, okay? You know, from negative 4 to 0, F is negative. It's below the x-axis without a doubt, which means from negative 4 to 0, negative F would be positive, okay? It's not so bad. Or you could even do this. You actually draw negative F, right? If you negate a function, a function represents Y values, you're negating every Y value. You're really just reflecting the function in the x-axis, okay? So that's going to look a little something like this, okay? And then you could just check above and below that way if you want to. But if you keep going here from 0 to 2, F is positive. So negative F is going to be negative from 0 to 2. And from 2 to 3, F is negative, which means negative F is going to be positive. It's not as bad as you might think. They want to know where H is decreasing. So H decreasing on, and we know it's from 0 to 2 because justification, okay? You could still justify in the terms of the graph that you're given if it's negative. The reason we know is because negative F is less than zero, which should be good enough, by the way, to give you the points, okay? You still justified in terms of F. You just justified in terms of F's opposite. If that's bothering you, remember negative F uh, less than zero means F is actually greater than zero, which might be a better way to put it down. Either way, should be easy to pick up, maybe not easy, okay, but certainly doable to pick up A and B. That's five points, man. You know, if you could pick up just one more point for this or two more points for here, like you should be able to do part D. All right, it's worth two points. Maybe you flub something up, you only get one point. Six out of nine, not so bad for this problem and definitely a possible nine out of nine for some of you uh, extra intelligent folks out there. Okay, so things to think about. Let's go to 2014. Um, number three, no calculator here as well. Okay, and let's get rocking and rolling. Do you like calculus? Yes, I do. Search your feelings. You know it to be true. You failed me for the last time. Sorry, I want to get some Darth Vader uh, quotes going on. Um, you guys have never failed me. You've always done um, what you need to do, and you can do great on this AP. I know a lot of you don't feel that way, but you really should. Uh, number three, the function f is defined on the closed interval negative 5 to 4. Oh, maybe this is F, but it's not. The graph of F consists of three line segments. Oh, it is F. The graph of F, sometimes it's F prime and other problems. The graph of F consists of uh, three line segments and is shown in the figure above. G is the other function they're giving you here. G, we know, is an accumulation function. Write down, make sure you actually, um, you know, write down taking the derivative. The second you see an accumulation function on the AP, Take that derivative, g prime of x is equal to f of x. And that means that g double prime of x equal to f prime of x. We didn't really use that in our justification last uh, question, but I'll show you how that might end up in a justification this question. But we did use it to solve certain parts of the problems. Not part A. Part A, they just want g of 3. So just replace the x, you know, the argument of the accumulation function with the 3. So that's the integral from negative 3 to 3 of uh, f of t with respect to t. Let's see if this one's going to be annoying or not. Okay, negative 3 up to 3. So here's negative 3 and here's positive 3 right here. Okay, so from negative 3 up to positive 3. Integrating forward, we know this is going to be positive uh, and this right here is going to be negative. We're going to have to add them together. This is one big triangle. It's pretty easy to get the area. One half base times height. This right here is one big triangle. To get the area, the base is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So that base right there is 5. The height is 1, 2, 3, 4. So the height's going to be 4. 1 half times 5 times 4 is really 2 times 5, which is 10 right there. Integrating forward, the regions above, we know that's actually going to be positive 10. Plus, and then I'm going to put a negative right here because I know that the integral from 2 to 3 is going to be negative because it's integrating forward the regions below. This bothers people. They're like, I know the base right here is 1. What's the height of this right triangle? What does it look like? Doesn't it look like it's 2? Then just make it 2. You know, if you don't have the calculator, you can take things with a grain of salt, okay? If you had to, what you're really supposed to do is you're supposed to get the equation of this line. It's not bad. You can easily get the slope, uh, and then the y-intercept you can see is 4, and then you could plug into that equation. But you're just going to waste time that way. If it's a non-calculated question, just guesstimate. Looks like that's our negative 2 right there. So 1 half times 1 times 2 is just going to be 1. The area is 1. The integral is negative. And you could even put 10 plus negative 1 and just box it in right there to really draw their ire. I'm going to put 9 just because 9. Okay, but, um, you know, hey, a little interesting. This bothers people. Don't let it bother you. And some people are like, wait, what if it's not right? Da, da, da. Well, take a shot, okay? You know, don't necessarily do something that's going to cause you to waste a lot of time when you could do something where it's a lot shorter and you're going to end up with the right answer anyway. You know, part B, um, what open intervals contained uh, from negative 5 to 4 is the graph of G. 
both D increasing and concave down. You got to think if G is increasing, G prime is positive. And if G is concave down, G double prime is negative. You know, but they didn't tell us anything about G. This is all F right here. But remember, G prime is equal to F. So if G prime is positive, that means we want to know where F is positive. And G double prime is F prime. So we want to know where F prime is negative. What does F prime negative mean about F? That means F decreasing. So really, we're just looking for where F is positive and where F is decreasing. So above the x-axis, decreasing. If you want, you could draw the two lines, okay? And on my solution... I do draw the two lines, okay? So you could look at it that way if you want to, but it's a lot easier to just be like, hey, I wanna see where F is above the x-axis and decreasing. So that's happening from what? Negative five to negative three. Does it happen again? Probably happens again. Yeah, it looks like from zero to two, right? Uh, F is positive, but it's decreasing. You know, and then to justify, give a reason to your answer, it's what we used, okay? Because F greater than zero and F, is decreasing. All right, so it actually makes the problem a lot easier if you know about the justification. Uh, maybe you said G prime greater than zero accidentally. Over here, you said G prime is equal to F, so you would be okay, okay, in that case. It wouldn't really help you here because F is decreasing. Maybe you say G double prime is negative. That means you really said F prime is negative. You might get a point for that, but they really want you to say the slope of F is negative or F is decreasing, but you could still end up getting a point right there feasibly, okay? So I don't think B is really that terrible, A and B right there, that's three points all together. See, A is only worth one point, and you can really cause yourself to have a lot of uh, anxiety over this slope piece right here for just one point. Try not to worry about it too much, okay? Just power through. Part C, really cool, they give you this function H, they tell you it's it's partially abstract, right? Equal to g of x over 5x. Okay, and they actually want you to find h prime of 3. So I want to take the derivative, <clears throat> excuse me, of h of x, so h prime of, <clears throat> excuse me, why am I drooling all over that? Oh, because I need the, uh, the quotient rule. Makes me drool. This is the bad drool. How does quotient rule start? Everybody, one, two, three, back in. Okay, so here we know the second function is 5x times the derivative of the first. I don't even know what g of x is. How am I supposed to know what the derivative of? It's g prime of x. Okay, it's derivative of g of x minus the first function, g of x, times the derivative of the second, which we know is five, over second squared, five x quantity squared. So that's our derivative right there. We want to evaluate it, uh, x equals three, so h prime of three. So now we know we want five times three, which is 15, times g prime of three, minus g of three, times five over our 15 squared. Now people are like, how am I supposed to find G prime of three? Remember G prime of three is really just the same thing as F of three. And we know F of three is really equal to, well, we're kind of guesstimating that it's equal to negative two, but close enough for government work in this particular case. And G of three is actually interesting, but we already know that G of three is equal to nine because we got it in part A. Some people are like, well, what if I couldn't do part A? What if I skipped over it? Then just make something up for G of three, okay? If you have to use something in an earlier part of a problem to for a later part of a problem, doesn't mean that the later part of the problem is, is gonna be more difficult. And if you couldn't do the earlier part, you can't do the later part. It just means make up a value. You're supposed to make up a value that's supposed to be equal in difficulty to the nine, which is impossible for you to do, because how would you know it's a nine? If you knew it, then you'd use the nine. Try not to use zero or something like that. Try to just use a regular number, put like a six in there or something like that. Um, this right here, you could actually go right to saying that h prime of 3 is equal to, you could even say 15 times negative 2 minus 9 times 5 over 15 squared. And I would just leave it like that. Stick it to the squirrels. Okay, you could actually calculate it out. If you want to, um, you end up getting negative one third, but don't worry about stuff like that, okay? Especially on a part two on an AP, you don't need to simplify. We're almost there, part D, the function P. P uh, is defined by P of X equals, oh, it's also partially abstract, F of, but I know what the argument is, right? The quantity X squared minus X. Find the slope of the line tangent, <laughs> the slope of the tangent line to the graph of P, P is the original, at the point where X equals negative one. So we want P prime of negative one, which means first you need P prime of X. Chain, 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 roo, hoo. Okay, remember, if you want to take the derivative of a function, whose argument is not one single x, 
You got to use the chain rule. Take the derivative of the outside function first, f prime. Rewrite the inside function. A function means nothing without its argument. You must rewrite the argument, then multiply by the derivative of the argument. And if you write it this way, you're wrong without parentheses. I wish we had a teacher who was really like forcing me to use parentheses last year and this year. Oh, you do. Hey, um, now we want p prime and negative one. So by the way, cool little abstract derivative here that so many people on the AP are gonna have no idea how to do. It's very doable, you could do it. It's just the chain rule, you know, remember the chain rule? Well, recall, recall. Um, you know, pardon my language, but if you have y equals f of u, you know, that means that dy over dx is equal to f prime of u times du over dx. And that's what we have down here. We have f prime of u, sorry, f prime of u, times du over dx. Plug in the negative one, we get f prime of, you know, negative one squared is one minus negative one. So one minus negative one is really one plus one, which is gonna be two right there. So that's really gonna be f prime of two times, two times negative one is gonna be negative two minus one is negative three. People are like, how do I get f prime of two given the graph of the function f? Well, this is the slope of f at x equals two. Slope of f at x equals two, or the slope of the line tangent to f at x equals two. Slope of the tangent line by a graph, well, you can't even draw the tangent line at x equals two. If you try to draw the tangent line, you just end up redrawing the function, which is actually awesome, because that just means it's a linear, and you need the slope of that linear. Let's just use average rate of change, starting at the point zero comma four, and ending at the point four comma negative four. So if you want f prime of two, f prime of 2 is going to be equal to negative 4 minus 4 over uh, 4 minus 0. You can even take that and plug it in there if you really want. Wow, you really want to stick it to the squirrels? Negative 4 minus 4 over 4 minus 0 times negative 3. You could do it, okay? Nothing wrong with something like that. What does this become here? Negative 8 divided by 4 is negative 2. So negative 2 times negative 3, really positive 6. But once again, stick it to the squirrels. Okay, uh, as far as the AP exam is concerned. So accumulation function, very, very similar to the graph of uh, F prime, which we did yesterday. So do your homework. Okay, try it out. I think you have some more homework problems. You can start having like three problems instead of two. Look, watch the videos, do your homework. If you don't, you're going to get crushed on the AP exam. I've seen fives, surefire fives. Kids, you get 90s and above, 95s and above all year. Get ones because they stop excuse me, caring, I have hiccups. Um, if you're stopping caring because you have a major family problem right now or something, you know, that's kind of understandable. It's hard for me to, to say anything about that. Um, but if you can put in the work, okay, you'll really do well. Um, we gotta talk more about how we're gonna do this thing online here, but try not to worry about that. Every day, watch that video, uh, you know, follow along with me, try the problems on your own. If you need to, you know, lump things together, you know, and do a couple lessons over the weekend, I get it. Um, but try to keep that you're doing math every day Keep it fresh in your mind. Um, tomorrow and the next day, we'll get some integrate the rate going on. Remember, if you integrate the rate at which you stack bananas on a shelf, you'll find out how many bananas were actually stacked on the shelf, right? The change in the number of bananas on the shelf. Things like that we speak about uh, tomorrow. For now, we're on a 23-hour, 15-minute break. So, uh, well, that's what it used to be. But now people are probably doing these lessons all kinds of interesting times. Um, but look, you'll have a take-home coming out. Probably part of the homework tonight. We'll say that's due on probably Friday, maybe Monday, but I want to put Friday because I want to get a sense of urgency from some of you guys because I feel like some of you aren't being urgent, but maybe I'll change it to being Monday. I don't know. Anyway, um, this is Berno signing off. Adios, y'all.